Well, good morning, everyone. For those who don't know me, my name is Dave. Uh, we're grateful that you're here with us at Grace Ridge, and uh, we're also welcoming those who are tuning in online. We're grateful that you're there, too. Uh, we're going to start off the morning with some worship, so let's all stand together. I uh, encourage you to sing, we'll lift our voices to the Lord, and uh, it's going to be a great day today. My sin was before me, I was swallowed by pride. But out of the darkness you brought me to your light. You showed me new mercy and opened up my eyes. From the day you saved my soul to the very moment when I day you saved my soul. When brilliant light is all around, and endless joy is the only sound. Oh, rest my heart forever. Till the very moment when I come home, I'll sing, I'll dance, my heart will overflow from the day you saved my soul. From the day you saved my soul Till the very moment when I come home I'll sing, I'll dance, my heart will overflow From the day you saved my soul From the day you saved my soul
into the darkness to shine. Out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you. Not like you. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer. Awesome and Yeah. 
We believe in the Holy Spirit, and He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe that He conquered death. We believe in the resurrection, and He's coming back. He's coming back again. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, that is that is all for you, Lord. We just uh, come before you so thankful. And we thank you for a new year. Lord, we thank you for your ever-present and unchanging love for us, Lord. And we're so thankful for you coming uh, in form of a baby, Lord, for living, for dying for us, Lord, for resurrecting. Lord, we thank you so much for all that you've done for us. And Lord, we truly confess that we believe and we want to learn more and know more about you, Lord. Have us hunger and thirst after you. Lord Jesus, we just uh, thank you for, for this time together to join, to worship you. And uh, may we just give you all the honor and glory. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Happier New Year. <laughs> That's what I've been saying to everybody this, this week. Happier New Year. I um, was watching on um, Thursday night, a little bit on television. It was so interesting how many people were saying good riddance to 2020. <laughs> so just grateful for uh, that song particular in that moment. I'm just praying that that's what the church in 2021 will stand on. We believe in what God can do in our midst and that he will prevail. So um, this morning, I just want to um, just do a short introduction uh, for the person that's going to be speaking to us this morning. Um, her name is Superintendent Pam Brayman. She, we sometimes call her Super Pam. Um, she is our conference superintendent, um, and she has the daunting job of overseeing 60 churches, uh, both in New York and in Pennsylvania. Um, so if you think of her uh, after the message, please be praying for her. She's got a daunting job. Um, it's grateful there's so many churches this morning that will be hearing what we're hearing. Um, because she wants to be an encouragement to us in this new year. So we're very honored to have her with us this, this morning and um, on the screen and just thank her so much for all she does for Jesus' sake and I pray this will be a blessing. My name is Pam Brayman, and I'm the superintendent of the Genesis Conference. The Genesis Conference is a network of free Methodist churches in western and central New York and north central Pennsylvania, and your church is a part of Genesis. I'm excited to be with you today, even though it has to be virtually and through video. Today I'm going to be telling you a story, or I, perhaps I should say retelling you a story. I'm going to be telling you the story of Philip the Evangelist. Philip is mentioned in Acts chapter 6, Acts chapter 8, and Acts chapter 21. But I'm going to be fleshing out his story, adding to it some historical research, some things that are in the context of the scripture, and some of my imagination. And I'll be doing this in a more dramatic sort of fashion. I've learned over the years that sometimes retelling the stories of Scripture bring them alive to us in a new and fresh way and allow the Lord to speak to us in a new and fresh way as well. 
I'll be telling you the story from the perspective of, his, of one of his daughters. His daughters are actually mentioned in Acts chapter 21. He had four daughters and they were, we're told that they prophesied. They were prophets. They were probably leaders in the church, but we know very little about them. But I will be taking on the persona of one of his daughters today in order to tell you the story of Philip. In a moment, I will have a piece of black or gray fabric draped around me. And as long as that's draped around me, I'm pretending to be Philip's daughter. And when I take it off, I'm back to being just Pam. I hope you enjoy listening to this story today. And as you listen, pay attention to the parts of the story that get your attention, because I believe that in those places that are most interesting to you in the story, God has an invitation for you there. Let me pray. Lord, I pray that we would be listening to your spirit stirring in us today, just as Philip was a man who listened deeply to your spirit. And I pray that we wouldn't just be listening, but that we would be responding as well. I pray that you would take this story of Philip and my words, and that you would be using them in such a way as to be speaking to the hearts and minds of those who are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Hello, friends. I understand you want to hear the story of my father, Philip. I would be happy to tell you his story, uh, but I should probably make sure you understand that my father, Philip, is not the same as, as Philip of the Twelve. My father, Philip, was of the Seven. Uh, the Philip of the Twelve was one of the Twelve Apostles, but Philip of the Seven... I'm confusing, aren't I? Let me start from the beginning. <laughs> My family is from Caesarea, uh, the Caesarea on the Mediterranean, the port Caesarea. It's a port that was created by Herod the Great in order to become the port of Samaria. Now, we're not Samaritans, we are Jewish, uh, but we are what is called Hellenistic Jews. Um, I should explain that there are two different kinds of Jews during our time. One is Hebraic Jews and one is Hellenistic Jews. Uh, the Hebraic Jews are very strict. They, they are very obedient to the absolute letter of the law with the, the law and, and the word of God. They are isolated. They protect themselves. Uh, many of our Pharisees are Hebraic. We are Hellenistic Jews. We are Jewish. We go to synagogue, uh, but we have no problem adapting, being part of culture. <laughs> we speak Greek. The Hebraic Jews speak Hebrew and Aramaic. We enjoy the culture. My father is in the business world. In fact, it would be very hard to be a Hebraic Jew in Caesarea. Caesarea is a center for culture, for the military, for business. We are Hellenistic Jews. Yes, we go to synagogue. Yes, we go up to Jerusalem for the feasts and the holy days. But we are not strict like the Hebraic Jews. During this time, we began to hear a rumbling in the Hebraic Jewish culture of a teacher, a prophet, by the name of Yeshua, uh, Jesus. Uh, this teacher, this prophet, was intriguing to us because he, even though he was coming from Hebraic culture, he, he seemed to break the rules of many of the Pharisees, many of the religious leaders and teachers. Uh, he, he, he challenged the status quo. We were intrigued and hoping he would come to Caesarea, but he didn't. We then heard he had gone through Samaria, our, our area, um, and there had actually stopped to talk to a Samaritan woman, of all things, and to this Samaritan woman, who was not a Jew, to this Samaritan woman, he proclaimed he was the Messiah, and she went and told her village. She went and told her village. This was certainly out of the ordinary. And so as we prepared to go up to Jerusalem for the Passover feast, we were intrigued. We wanted to hear from this Yeshua, this Jesus. We wanted to hear what he had to say. Of course, that Passover week turned out much differently than what he anticipated. That was the week that Yeshua, Jesus, was arrested and tried, crucified, and then resurrected. <laughs> My father, and in fact all of us, first 
became followers of Jesus on what we now call the day of Pentecost. It was a day when the Holy Spirit was poured out upon those original followers of Jesus, that community of 120, and they went out into the streets preaching the good news of Jesus. One of his followers was preaching in Greek, in my language, <laughs> and she was preaching about this Jesus and saying he had died and was resurrected, that he was the true Messiah. And as crazy as that sounded, there was power in what she was saying. And we felt this drawing, this decision to follow this Yeshua. And so we became believers. We quickly became enveloped in this ever-growing community, this enlarging community where thousands of people were coming to be followers of Yeshua. It was a wonderful time when we saw miracles of God taking place and we heard his word. The apostles taught us. We, they began to open the scriptures and explain how Jesus was the fulfillment, was the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy. And in the beginning, both the Hebraic Jews who had become followers of Jesus and the Hellenistic Jews who had become followers of Jesus, even though our culture was so different and even though our language separated us, there was this unity among us. And yet, in the weeks to come, um, as some realities set in, uh, a gap began to widen. You see, part of the struggle for the new church was that we suddenly found ourselves with people that needed care. In particular, widows who had been kicked out of the synagogue when they became followers of Jesus and had depended upon the synagogue for their livelihood, for their income, for their food, for their, for their housing, suddenly had no place to go. And so this young church, this young giving church, would, would, would give generously, wildly. People were selling property in order to make sure that no one went hungry. It was a beautiful thing. And, and yet as time went on, it became clear that those who were Hebraic Jews, the widows of Hebraic Jews, were, were getting special treatment. I don't think it was intentional. I, I think it was just that you make sure you care for the people that you know and the original followers of Jesus were, for the most part, Hebraic Jews. And so they were caring for the people they knew, but suddenly there was this whole group of people who were not being cared for, who were Hellenistic Jews. And so a group of our leaders went to the apostles, my father among them, to point out that this was not right, that our widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. The apostles blessed them, listened, and recognized something needed to be done. But they also recognized that their call was prayer and preaching of God's word. And so they asked the group to come up with seven names of people that they said were full of wisdom and the Holy Spirit. And they would hand this administrative role over to them. They would hand over this distribution of food. My father was one of the seven who was chosen. He truly is a man who is wise and who is full of the Holy Spirit and, and empowered by the Holy Spirit. In addition, he has administrative skills that he learned in his business in Caesarea. And so he and the other six began to do an outstanding job of the distribution of bread. And the fact that the seven were for the most part Hellenistic Jews and the 12 were for the most part Hebraic Jews meant that they began to work together in a beautiful way. We had planned on staying in Jerusalem for a period of time far longer than we normally would have for the simple reason that while we were in Jerusalem, we were, we were learning from the apostles and, and, and we were learning uh, 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 more and more about this Yeshua, about this Jesus, and we were in this community that was sweet and we were in this place where God was at work and why would we, would we hurry back to Samaria or to Caesarea? That was our thinking until Stephen, who was another one of the seven and a close friend of my father's, uh, Stephen was arrested. But Stephen was a man who God had used to perform miracles through. 
He was a man who was uh, powerfully gifted by the Holy Spirit. He was also a man who had no problem speaking the truth. And so when Stephen was arrested and brought in on charges that were not valid, uh, Stephen did not hesitate to tell the truth. And part of that truth was that the leaders, the Jewish leaders, the Sanhedrin, who he had been brought in front of, they were a, as he put it, a stiff-necked people who would not pay attention to the fact that the Messiah had been in their midst. Needless to say, this didn't go over well. <laughs> and in fact, the mob that had been brought together to hear Stephen was riled up and they stoned him to death. This one event allowed persecution to break out all throughout Jerusalem. It was as if a floodgate was opened and people recognized they could be allowed to, to persecute us any way they wanted to. And it was decided that those of us who were from other places, we needed to scatter. <laughs> we needed to go home. We needed to go to the four corners of the globe. Ironically, looking back on it, it would seem that that's what Jesus had wanted us to do from the very beginning when he told us to go from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. And yet we had not moved from Jerusalem because the community was so sweet <laughs> and things were going so well. And it was persecution that required us to get moving. Those of us who were scattered told the news wherever we went. Why wouldn't we? We had such good news to tell. And not only would we tell the news, but we would pray and see people healed and, and see people's lives transformed. <laughs> there was one particular city that we went to on our way home, the city of Samaria, where my father saw many, many people come to know Jesus. He would preach and crowds would come. He would explain who Jesus was. We would, we would see people healed. We would, we would see prayer answered. We would see demons flee. There were so many people who became followers of Jesus in this town, in this city, that the apostles were called upon to come. Interestingly enough, while my father had the Holy Spirit in him and, and working through him, and we had the Holy Spirit in us and working through us, when people came to follow Jesus in this particular town, the Holy Spirit did not fall upon them. We later realized this was, this was that first step in what Jesus said to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria. <laughs> Because, in fact, in this city of Samaria, it was not just Hellenistic Jews, it was Samaritans as well. And so the apostles came and, and prayed, and the Holy Spirit fell upon this group of Samaritans. There was one man in particular there called Simon who, who wanted to pay the apostles for the ability to bring the Holy Spirit to people. The apostles put him in his place, I can tell you that. But anyway, that is their story, not my father's. My father continued to preach. We went on from Samaria, from the city of Samaria, and then went on to our home in Caesarea, where he again preached, and this time we saw our friends who were Hellenistic Jews come to know Jesus. We began a gathering there, a community there, which you would call a church there in Caesarea. We saw God at work in powerful, powerful ways. And the news of Jesus began spreading, not just through us, but through all the others who were scattered around the globe. And communities began to form. And the word of God went out and the power of God went out. It was a wonderful, beautiful time, even in the shadow of the persecution that was happening first back in Jerusalem and then began to move out towards us. It was during that time that an angel appeared to my father. I should say this was not a normal occurrence, but my father had no doubt that this messenger was from God and came with a very simple message, simple instructions. Uh, go south to the desert road, the road that runs between Jerusalem and Gaza. That was all, <laughs> nothing more. 
My father, knowing that it really is best when God gives us a directive, instructions, invitations to follow the voice of God, bid us goodbye. <laughs> we didn't know how long he'd be gone. We didn't know what mission God had him on, and yet we knew he would follow the word of the Lord. He came back weeks later with a fascinating story. On his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, a man from Africa, who was an official in the treasury there, the queen's treasury. He was in a very ornate chariot. He had come up to Jerusalem to worship and was on his way home. And when my father saw him, the Holy Spirit whispered, go to that chariot and stay near it. And so the chariot was moving and my father came running up besides the chariot. And the spirit prompted him to say, do you understand what you're reading? <laughs> and the man was reading the book of Isaiah. And, and the man said, well, how can I until, unless someone explains this to me? And so he invited my father to come up into this ornate chariot, this man he had never met. He invites him to come up and of course my father is able to explain it to him because the man is reading the passage about our Lord Jesus. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter and as a silent lamb before the shears is not silent. So he did not open his mouth, the passage from Isaiah 53. As soon as my father realized that the man was reading Isaiah 53, he understood that this was the appointment that God had sent him to. And so he began to explain the word of the Lord to this Ethiopian. The Ethiopian became a follower of Jesus and immediately wanted to be baptized. And as soon as my father baptized him, my father was in a new place. He can't explain it to this day. He says the spirit took him from one place to another. And yet, when my father listened to the voice of God, he opened up an entirely new continent to the word of God. That Ethiopian took the word of God back to Africa. Friends, I want to stop there in my father's story. And I want to make a few invitations to you as you hear my father's story. First, I want to go back to talking about how the Hellenistic Jews and the Hebraic Jews were so different. And yet, when we came together to follow Jesus, Jesus invited us to this new community. And it wasn't perfect, because in the beginning, the Hebraic Jews' widows were being cared for and the, and the Hellenistic Jews' widows were not. And yet, the Hebraic apostles invited the Hellenistic seven into leadership. And together with Hebraic Jews and Hellenistic Jews, we formed a community that became so unusual <laughs> that people noticed. And God added to our number daily those who were being saved. I know during your time that there are people in different political positions. You too have conservatives and progressives. If you allow that to split your church, you miss the opportunity from God to instead work together so that people can be in awe that a community can have such a diverse group you miss the opportunity to see daily people being saved because they look at your community and want what you have. If you are someone who has been feeling like you are right and you want your church to just be people like you, then I want to tell you, you are missing an opportunity for the Holy Spirit to be at work. Would you reach out to those who aren't like you? because the end result is that the Holy Spirit is at work and people come to know the Lord Jesus. I also want to remind you that for us, when persecution broke out, 
it made the way that we had been meeting impossible. We had been meeting not only house to house, but we had been meeting in the temple courts. We had been meeting publicly. And when persecution broke out, that way of meeting was no longer possible. <laughs> and so instead, we scattered. And when it first happened, it was so difficult. And yet God used that for the word of God to spread. I understand you are in a time right now when many of you cannot meet the way you've met in the past. Not because of persecution, but because of disease. Friends, God allowed persecution in my time in the church so that the word of God would spread. I believe there is an invitation for you that in this time when the church is scattered in a different way than we were scattered, there is still an invitation for the word of God to spread. How might God use you to spread the word of God in a new way? And then finally, something that I think is important for you to hear from my father's story. When my father heard the whisper of God, he responded immediately. Do you? God speaks to us. He speaks to us through his word. You have the written word of God, which we did not yet have. He speaks to us through his spirit. He speaks to us through the needs around us that invite us to help. He speaks to us through the music that we sing and worship. He speaks to us through other people. Are we listening? Are we listening for his invitations? Are we looking for his invitations? And when we hear them, when we see them, do we respond immediately as my father did? My father and I have learned that when God gives an invitation, the power of God walks with you to fulfill that invitation. When God gives an invitation, there is the opportunity to make a significant difference. Sometimes in one life, as in the case of the Ethiopian eunuch, and sometimes in the life of a continent, as the Ethiopian eunuch went back to Africa with the good news of Jesus. Friends, God is giving us invitations every day. Are we listening? Are we obeying? How are you responding? There's an adventure out there. There's purpose out there. God can use us in profound ways. Will you listen? Will you respond? Back to plain old Pam. <laughs> Often when I retell the stories of scripture, I find that people hear God in a new, fresh way. So let me ask you, what was God whispering to you today? What part of the story got your attention? And what might be God's invitation for you in that? And how are you going to pay attention and do what God's asking you to do, just like Philip did? Let me pray. Lord God, I pray for each person who listened, and I pray that whatever piece of the story was stirring in them, that you would be using that in their lives so that they would take a step of faith. And I pray that as they take of that step of faith, as they do what they believe you are asking them to do, what you were inviting them to do, I pray you would be empowering them and that they would see your hand and that they would see you using them in such a way as to impact one person or the world. We pray that in the midst of this difficult season in, in the life of the world and the life of our country and the life of our churches, that we would see the possibilities and the invitations from you and we would not hesitate to step out in faith and to follow where you lead. We pray that we would have the same kind of faith that Philip had and the same kind of attentiveness to your spirit. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good to be with you today, friends. Would you stand with us, please, as we uh, close off the service with this last song? You are 
I worship you. I worship you. You are here working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are here moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are a way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. You are a way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you.
maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are a way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. standing quietly in front of the person who makes the one who makes all this possible that is who you are God thank you seated for a minute. One of the cool things about worship is that kind of at the beginning of our week, Sunday, or whenever you'll be listening to this, it can still be a part of your week. But I love that you take those words and they stick in your head and go home. And all through your week, all through your day, you remember that God is all of that and that is who he is. And we can stand on that. That's so cool. Thank the worship team for that. I just want to just uh, mention a few uh, announcements uh, that are important to this community. Um, if you are online, we are asking you to fill out that online connection card because I really want to know who's out there. I see all these beautiful faces, and I, and I know who's out there. I want to know who's out there, too. So you go on, on the site, and you... You click on that connection card and let us know that you're here. And let us know what we can do for you, uh, how we can pray. That's so important. I've had the privilege this week of praying with so many people in some really difficult circumstances. And have them come back and say, you know, how much it means to them to know that people are praying. So let us know if you've got prayer requests. And for those that are here, there's a green card out on the uh, lobby desk that you can fill out and let us know. Or you can send it office at graceridge.church. Um, on Friday and Saturday of this week, uh, we have two more occasions to say goodbye to our former lead pastor, Pastor Ted. Um, it will, it's a virtual reception that's going to occur. This is what he and Lori wanted to do, is to have a moment to be able to spend some time with the people that have meant so much to them through the years. So there, you can get on this. Um, um, you go, if you you're, should got, have gotten an e-news thing, if you didn't, then let us know through uh, office at graceridge.church and we'll connect you to this. Uh, it's at 6.30 on Friday, and it's at 4 o'clock on Saturday. So you can pick either one of those. Um, you can also do it on phone if you don't have a way to do it through Zoom. <laughs> uh, you can also do it through the phone. So just let us know about that. Again, at office at graceridge.church. Um, be watching the Grace Ridge e-news that comes through. If you're not getting that, let us know. Um, we want to... 
continue to encourage you to um, begin to uh, be begin again to give for the new year. Um, as we are going to continue to serve you, to serve you, to serve the community that we live in, to serve our world uh, through missions. So we are grateful for your continued support. And one of the special ways that you'll be able to give is that um, I was handed a message here. Um, their registration has begun for Flower City Work Camp for high school age teens and adult leaders are needed for this work camp. It's a mission trip in the city of Rochester that starts this year from June 28th till July 2nd. So they're looking for people to sign up, and you can do that at flowercityworkcamp.org. Um, and they're going to be doing 400 or so high school kids uh, from 7th and 8th grade that will be um, involved, and seniors will be able to attend if they're interested, even though you've graduated by then, hopefully, uh, June 28th. Um, there will be a conference for teens that will occur this week that Flower City would normally have happened uh, the week of spring break. It's still happening, and it's in planning stages. Um, so you, any more questions that you would have, please contact uh, Christine Bonke. She's here today. Or you can bonkyc at yahoo.com or 315-909-1124. Or contact us, and we'll get you the information. This is one of the ways that we serve this community. All right. Um, I think that's pretty much it. So let's stand and we'll pray. Lord, I truly hope and believe that what was said this morning, both in song and in word, you, Lord, will apply to each one of our lives, no matter where we are. And Lord, I so want us to go into this new year and make it the best ever. And whatever that is for each one of us, Lord, I, only you know, and that's between us and our God. So I pray that we'll take this to heart, what's been said this morning, Lord. And just want to thank you that you listen to us, that you hear us. So I pray that this morning and throughout this week, until we meet again, that we will listen to the whisper that you give us and that we will look for your invitations that you're going to send out to us and that you're going to give us to give to others. So just thank you and praise you, Lord, for being the God who hears and answers prayer. And we pray all this to you in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. So go in peace. Thanks. to Calvary.